More and more people are going to be looking for, how can I feel better? I've already gone to the doctor. I've taken all these prescriptions. I've had a couple surgeries. I've watched people in my family die. What do I need to do differently? Some some purple mustard greens here, okay. which which are super spicy, like wasabi. Oh yeah, yeah. Those are the spicy mustard. Yeah. Oh man, when yeah. you cook those, <laughs> there are people who are now inventing um, ways to 3D print uh, meat. Yeah. Right. 3D printing a salmon, 3D printing a steak. Right. Yeah. She said, "Well, you can't have an output without an input. So if you have a, a lab-grown meat." There has to be some kind of substance that you put into it in order for the machine to be able to output you a steak. And all of that, she said, is genetically modified. Peace and blessings, people. Welcome back to the channel once again. Well, we talk all things health and healing from a holistic perspective and today will be no different now you guys know that i own a tropical fruit farm and um it has been an amazing an amazing process not only just being able to grow my own food but the beauty of the process has been that i've been able to reconnect with the land and earth in a way that i haven't been able to do in a very long time and so, so today, I'm going to have a conversation with one of the people who inspired me to say, to go from, I think I want a farm, to I'm definitely getting a farm. His name is Eugene Cook. He is an internationally recognized food justice activist, an urban farmer, an agroecologist using ve veganic growing methods. Yes, sir. <laughs> a descendant of indigenous farmers and African refugees. Eugene has over two decades of growing food in urban areas, along with work study experience in Jamaica, Haiti, and Africa. Welcome to the show. Oh, doctor. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Man, Thank I, you for the opportunity. Man, this is an experience because, you know, we've had many conversations, and um, you were a part of my plant-based healing summit in 2019, and you floored many of the people as we were talking about food there. And since that time, 2019, a lot has changed in the food. Just in that very small amount of time, so much has changed. And that was part of the inspiration for me to say, you need your own land with your own food. And so I want you to tell the people a little bit about your journey to becoming a farmer and where did it begin? Mm, yeah, thank you for this opportunity because... I think for medical for professionals and food producers to sit down and have a conversation, it's valuable in a lot of ways because there can be class divides yep. in the food system yep. as well as um, uh, racial divides in the food system. Yep. So there's a lot of different divides in the food system that I wasn't aware of when I first started growing food. Yeah. So for myself, my, um, my oldest child is 24. Okay. So 24 years ago, I decided I had this similar epiphany as you, you know. I was renting a, a house in um, California, and I looked at the backyard, and I was like, man, there's no food growing back here. Yeah. And the woman I was with was pregnant, and it just made me think, like, I need to put a garden back here. And the reason I thought that way was because my parents had me keeping a garden my whole life as part of my chores, I didn't even think of it as anything special or anything um, product not productive, but anything that I was interested in. Were I, they were they farmers? My mother's family are farmers. Okay, gotcha. Yep, from Oklahoma. Gotcha. So my mother and father met in California. We're living a suburban life, but both of my father comes from Alabama, my mother comes from Oklahoma. So both of them were very familiar with the land and growing. And so even though they had a small backyard, part of their chores for their son was you have to water the garden, you need to plant the garden, yeah. go out and get this food before I get home from work so that we can have, you know. So it was just part of my thing, like vacuuming or taking out of the trash. Yeah. But once I knew I was going to become a father, something clicked in my head. Because up to that point, I was a visual artist. Okay. I was um, I was in college for visual art, for fine art, and then had come out of that and was thinking I was going to be a practicing visual artist, Okay. which is 
an unfulfillable dream in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Especially knowing I had this child coming. So I went in the backyard, started planting food, and met a community of people through the childbirth process who came over to the house and said, you got all this food growing. You should teach people how to grow food. Right. I said, well, I don't, I'm not in a position to teach anybody. They said, well, you know more than we know. Right. And once they said that, it made me really rethink the whole idea. But that's not farming. That was gardening. You feel what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The farming came later. Okay, got you, got you. So you get this inspiration um, to create food for your family as a, as a part of like sustainability. Food Mainly security. economic sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to thank you for that inspiration because, it, again, like what people have to understand about life, life is always bigger than you. And I, I I find that a man becomes a man when he starts to think beyond himself. Teach. Absolutely I agree with that. And so I want to thank you because again, you were one of the inspirations, you know, like for me taking a dream that I said to my, I always I said to myself I wanted a farm 15 years ago. Mm. But it seems so untangible to me. Like it, it seems so far away because mm. Even though my great grandmother, who grew up on a farm, this was just, it was like a playpen to me. Of course. <laughs> of course. Thank God. You know, yeah. but it wasn't necessarily something that I picked up the skills to be able to go right into. Absolutely. And through our conversations and interactions, you really inspired me to say, this could be done because you're teaching people how to grow their own food. And not only teaching people how to grow their own food, but in urban environments. And so now today, my farm is my utopia, my mm. safe place, my haven, that when I escape here, I go down to the farm and I forget about everything. I wake up at six o'clock in the morning, I take off my shoes and I just start walking around on the dew. Start looking at what nature grew overnight, what ripened, what I can pick, have breakfast, sit under the coconut tree, Man. pick a sour sop. And it has been such a magnificent part of my evolution. And and the funny thing is, you know, a lot of times you see your vision and their vision can sometimes be blurry when it's so far away. But being on the farm now, it's so 2020. Yeah, man. Crisp. And, and so it feels like I'm plugging into God when I'm on the farm. It literally does. It feels like I'm plugging myself back to source. Do you kind of get that same inspiration when you're on the farm? Every day. Yeah. And otherwise, I don't I don't think a farmer in America or in most parts of the world would continue to farm. Yeah. Right? When you when you see that there's been 600 almost 600,000 suicide farmer suicides in India over the last 10 yeah. years, 20 years. Yeah. You understand that anyone who's farming is doing it for something for that feeling you're talking about. Yeah. Because for myself as a black farmer and as somebody who didn't come up thinking he wanted to be a farmer, wasn't even, I mean, probably different even than you because I just didn't think about farming as, I wanted to be making art full time. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. I planted the garden so that I could ensure that during times of um, economic failure, I would there would still be food to eat. Yeah. Okay. Right? That's what I was planning. I was not thinking... Food security or food sovereignty or I didn't know any of these terms. These were not interesting to me at all. And but because I had the experience of being on my mother's, uh, my grandparents' farm, I seen a farm before. I knew how to grow food, whatever. But once I came to Atlanta, it changed yeah. because I looked and saw, coming from Southern California, I saw a place where so many black people were in positions of power, and so many black people had. Even the regular person in Southwest Atlanta is sitting on half an acre or an acre of land. Yeah. Coming from California, LA, I was like, "Damn, there could be they could be uh, they could be utilizing this land totally differently." Yeah. You know, when I looked at Atlanta, I saw a blank canvas of food production. Yeah. But growing food in a city is not like growing food. It's not like farming in a rural context. Yeah. Or a Caribbean context. Yeah. Farming in a city is a different a different thing. It is a totally different thing because, you know, I spent a lot of time in Jamaica and being in Jamaica, I mean, you could be traveling down a road and there's just a papaya tree there, a sugar apple tree over there, a soursop tree over here, a sweet sap tree, 
uh, a sapodilla just growing. Just growing. Moringa growing yeah. wild. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and here, because we've been so destructive with mm-hmm. the land, things don't grow as they would if you didn't cultivate it. Not just the land, the atmosphere as well. Indeed, indeed. And so, you know, I've come to a point where I understand that anything of significance comes out of the land. Yes, sir. So the trees to make our homes, the paper to the the paper to make our money, the furniture, all of it, the soil to grow food with, the cotton to make our clothes, the gold and the silver and the diamonds, the copper, the cobalt, the lithium that we use for our cell phones. Water, everything comes from the land, right? Yes, sir. And with that being said, our people, we're agricultural people. We're earthlings. <laughs> I mean, we're from earth. You know we came out of the land. You, you know what I mean? Saying? Not just the gold, but it's not like we fell from the sky. Right. This body is earth. Yeah, ashes to ashes, dust, dust to, to dust. dust. And so with that being said, even those who came over on ships and who were enslaved, Many of them were putting seeds of okra in their corn rolls or corn in their corn rolls so that they can bring the agricultural technology with them, right? See, absolutely. And so even post-1865, you see this sort of transition where we develop this hate for being farmers and growing our, our things out of the land. And at some point, it seems like we got this disconnection with the land. And a lot of that came from our trauma that many of us went through in terms of like the enslaved. And then some of that came with social economics in terms of understanding that we were transitioning to an industrial society. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, how important is it that we start to reclaim our relationship with the land as African people? Ooh, we... Yeah, it's fundamental, right? Because I was listening to somebody just recently and they were talking about um, those of us calling ourselves African are still using uh, the colonizer's language, right? Mm -hmm. And there can be this kind of debate back and forth. Okay, the original name was Al-Kabulan. And so at any given time, we are in these debates that really are inconsequential when it comes to what would you use, how would you engage with the land if you didn't have to name it? Yeah. Right? If you just were there, yeah. found yourself here, how would you engage with that land? Would it matter if you were in Africa or whether you were in America? Or Because you've got to sh- clothe yourself, yeah. you've got to shelter your family, you've got to feed your family, you've got to derive energy for your family. There's an amazing documentary called The Coconut Revolution. Okay. And The Coconut Revolution is about a small island off of Papua New Guinea that got embargoed. And when they got embargoed, they had no more gasoline coming to the island. So they took the coconut tree which was sacred to them, and they decided to use it for everything. Yeah. And so they used the coconut oil for fuel. They were using rivers to- and You can take the husk and make like a coal. A charcoal out of it. Exactly. So, And because of that coconut, they were able to not only become um, sustainable and keep stay alive, they were also able to fight back against the people who were embargoing on them yeah. because they made sure that they valued the place that they worked. Got you. Right? So for us as African people, a lot of us, myself included, have had ideas of returning to Africa and saying, if I go to Africa, things will be, I'll have more opportunity, things will be better, this, this, and this. May or may not be true, but the point in the matter is, is we're having those dreams from here. Yeah. So while we're here, if we have access to the land, we need to be utilizing it. We have to be cultivating that relationship gotcha. because many people can't travel. Yeah. For reasons of, you know, passport issues, all kinds of things. Right. So then we're here. Yeah. And what what would be the most sustainable relationship you can have in and even outside of the relationship with, with oneself is has to be with seeing the cycles of time. Yeah. Yeah. So when we start to garden or farm, we end up spending more time outside. Yep. So we start paying attention. Oh man, this the moon's getting full. Or the sun's at this place. Or the su- at this and yesterday time of the day. it was the, right. So we start to center ourselves and become geocentric, right? Oh, okay. Let the Earth be the center of my universe, not because we don't understand how the solar system works, but we understand that 
This is the actual place that we are. Yeah. We're not on the sun. We're not on the moon. We are on earth. Right. And this is where everything that we've ever experienced happened. Yeah, we're right where we need to be. We're right where we need to be. Yeah. So I think it's really, it's, um, it's fundamental because right now our nervous systems are shot and just the amount of excess radiation and electrical energy that is being carried in our body, there is no other place to store it. Yeah. Like we need to be off charging that into the soil. Yeah. What else think what other entity can can deal with it? Right. And and it's so so important that you mention language. It's so important. And then also culture is so important because culturally indigenous people are very different from a Eurocentric point of view. Absolutely. And the the best example that I always give people when it comes to that is that when Europeans first came here to the Americas, and they were trying to figure out how to get New England from the the local uh, natives. They gave them weapons and a few bags of food for a massive amount of land. Yes, sir. And most people would say, what would make a native person give away that amount of land for nothing? But it was because we, we as indigenous people have a very different concept of the land. It does not belong to us. We never, we never had this concept that land belonged to anybody. <laughs> like we believed that the land was pouring to us, giving us offerings, and we were there to be grateful for it. Whoa, what a teaching, though. And so it's so important that we realize that we have to get back to that point, and not necessarily from the, the standpoint now that you have to have ownership of land because that's what's happened. But it's important to understand you have to have a relationship with the land because that is where the healing comes from. Teach. That's where everything comes from. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that's coming up a lot on the internet now is the fact that Bill Gates has bought over 240,000 acres of farmland. And now you find out Katy Perry, who is a singer, and her husband- mm. I believe his name is Orlando Bloom, mm. bought the Bragg's Apple Cider Vinegar Company, mm. and they have teamed up with Bill Gates mm. and now are using his A-Pill apples. Mm. Now, let me sort of educate the audience a little bit about what A-Pill is, mm. A-P-E-E-L. It uses monosaccharides and disaccharides, which are by- byproducts of all oil processing. Okay, so the byproducts of, you know, things like uh, soybean oil, Mm. canola oil, which are very harmful to the body. And these byproducts are trans fats. This is really important. They're trans fats. Trans fats in most countries, all of Europe, are banned. And the reason why they're banned is because they cause coronary heart disease. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your position as somebody who understands the land, respects the land, who is growing, showing people how to grow, what's your position on like watching somebody buy this amount of land with that type of intention behind it? That's a challenging question. Um, not because it's not clear, but just because it's hard to articulate. Yeah. I think that I heard Dr. Vandana Shiva say something really important, and she said, There are people who are now inventing um, ways to 3D print uh, meat. Yeah. Right? 3D printing a salmon, 3D printing a steak, right? Yeah. She said, well, you can't have an output without an input. So if you have a a lab-grown meat, there has to be some kind of substance that you put into it in order for the machine to be able to output you a steak. And all of that, she said, is genetically modified soy. Yeah. So they're going to be putting soy into the machine, mixing it with the culture of the of the of that particular meat, creating a lab grown meat, yeah. feeding it soy. Yeah. <laughs> so the the purchase of this large amount of farmland is for the intention of having everything be patented and barcoded. That's what I wanted you to get to. And that's what it's about. 
you can't have it patented and barcoded if it hasn't been run through the intellectual property of a human being. Yeah. So they take something like soybeans, they run it through this machine, bl blend it with all these different cultures and stem cells that they have to 3D print out a turkey or a steak or a salmon that is now, there. they own it past the time of it going into you, similar right. to, the, to the vaccinations. It's technology. It's technology now. It's not... A food, it's not an animal, it's now somebody's intellectual property that we're consuming. Yeah. So when we start consuming, yeah, of course the trans fats are a certain, that's a very real threat. And when we start to take a corporate intellectual property into our body, we now start to lose some dominion and sovereignty over our own body. Right. We can't, we can't initiate the healing mechanisms anymore. It's being blocked. We don't even know what has been put into that. Yeah. We only know a part of what the rest of it's proprietary, the rest of it is, you know, they're not going to tell you what is in a, what's in a peel. They're just going to tell you the part that they there's some part of those ingredients that are they're saying, "Hey, that's our corporate intellectual property. We don't want to tell you what we're coating the the apples with." You know, it's interesting how many people want to get into food, but how few people want to get into farming. Yeah. There's so many food folks, products, really. Food products. Yeah, that's that's what I think of it. Yeah, and you know, so most people have the perception of food that food comes from the grocery store. And Do they really? Though? Yeah, most people think that's the source of food. When I when I ask people where does your food come from, they like I get it from the grocery store. Yeah. They don't instantly think a farmer somewhere oh, created definitely this. Not. Definitely not. And so they look at the grocery store as the source, the origin of food. And most of the food in the grocery store isn't food at all. It's just like what I just said. It's food products that has traveled thousands of miles, been sprayed and irradiated. How, is, how important is it that we know where our food comes from today, given that? Because picking back in on what you just said ago, in my opinion, lag grown meat has been probably what people have been eating for the last five to 10 years. True, absolutely. And now that nobody has, the whole population hasn't fallen out over it, they're saying, let's make it go. I mean, the whole population hasn't fallen out. They said seven out of 10 of the young people who would be drafted to go into a military from the United States would not be eligible yeah. because of obesity, because of criminal records, and because of mental conditions. Yeah. So. It, we have fallen. I think it's because it's not traceable. Yeah. I think it's because these pandemics cannot be, or these epidemics can't be traced to one source. Right. It's the only reason they talk about it, because there's a compounding of toxins. Yeah. Right now, there's a compounding of toxins from air to microplastics to whatever. Um, I may have missed... The, I didn't even let you get to your question, I think. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're answering it, because the, the thing is, like, how important is it that we know where our food is oh, coming from, right. because... You know, now we now we start to understand there's lab grown meat. We know that genetically modified foods were created in the 1990s and went wildfire in the 2000s. You know, you think about that's, long, that's somebody's whole life. Yeah, yeah. So for the last 20 years, let's take a 20 year old, your son, 24. Absolutely, and if, the difference it, in his experience has blown his mind and my mind because so, for him, it's just his lifestyle. Yeah. But now he's 24, and his friends have had all these cavities. All these different, uh, mm, how do you call it, like contagious infectious diseases yeah. or even just a regular earache. And he didn't do any of that. Yeah. He never experienced any of that stuff. Yeah. And he's looking at me like that. And I was like, this is because of the decisions your mother and I made that people thought were unpopular, that the family wasn't happy about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? All, why, don't, why aren't you feeding him this? Why aren't you? But he ain't got no cavities now, no allergies, no... no um, Attention deficit disorder, got a full head of hair, like, you know, he's fine. Yeah. And he's looking at his friends going, man, these people are falling apart at 22. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and you juxtaposition that, you take him over here and then somebody, a child in the underserved neighborhood, oh, our man. community, who has grown up eating a standard American diet, 70% processed, a large majority when you're in a, in an underserved community coming from places like Family Dollars and the dollar store, and you start to look around and you understand why we're so sick. Yeah, when you ask how important is it though, it's um, 
it's it's like adding a a weight onto a very already heavy to do list. Yep. You know what I mean? If somebody's living in any kind of situation in America right now, then to think about the the origins of my or sourcing my food properly and where the origin man it, it sounds like a, another problem for a person to have to think about. Yeah. You feel what I mean? Yeah. It sounds like another burden just to live. Like I got to So yeah, I understand that it's important. I just I have been spending the last 20 years of my life trying to address that. Yeah. And not ever really wanting to, but being um matured and guided into it because of the way I came into agriculture. Yeah. Because I came into agriculture from a different perspective, I've always looked at it as a as a hustler or an artist would look at it. Yeah. Right? Because I've been trying to feed my children this whole time. Yeah. I don't have a farm that my grandparents handed down to me. I didn't even know how to use a tractor or any of that kind of stuff. So I'm out here thinking about food from the perspective of how do I get people to show up to a farmer's market? How do I get them to eat it? How what kind of recipes do I have to put out? You know, all this. And then the content comes into, I mean, how many farmers are making content 20 years ago or 10 years ago? You know what I mean? Right. So now I was thinking about how to market it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. And because I know who needs the food the most are people who, it can't be an extra burden for them to go and look for good food. They already got a weight on them. It's too much, man, to ask somebody whose schools for their children are substandard, whose medical care is substandard, whose housing is substandard, to be like, oh, you shouldn't eat that because it's uh, you know, not organic or it's processed. Yeah. Nigga, they know it's processed. They, yeah. That's not 100%. you ain't telling them. They're not, they're not dumb. They're looking at you like, okay. And so where should I get the food you're talking about? On the bus. Yeah. How, how, where am I gonna get it from? Yeah. And so that's been part of my um, drive as I've traveled, as I've seen different parts of the world. I remember being in Kenya my first time in 2007, being in Nairobi and a homeless woman coming up to me with her children asking for money to get food. And I remember thinking, we're on the equator. Yeah. We're on the equator. We're, if there's ever a spot where there's an abundant amount of food, yeah. it's on the equator. Yeah. So why does she not have food? It's not because it's not available. You feel what I mean? Yeah. It's because it's strategically monitored. It's strategically maneuvered. The way food moves around the planet is strategic. Yeah. It's not by accident. Yeah. So I don't know if it should fall on the consumer to find and locate good food. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. That should be somebody else's. That should be like, why do we have a government if we're not? If it's not about having food? Yeah. And we've been sort of cheated in a way and programmed in a way where we don't we don't connect ourselves with the ability to create food. Man, we don't con- connect ourselves with creativity hardly at all. Yeah. Because even what we've seen happen to hip hop over the last, that same year, that same from- Time span. Hip, what happened? <laughs> I mean, hip hop used to only be about educating us. Right. That's what, it, that's what I turned, tuned into the music for, was to hear- P.E. put Minister Farrakhan in the beginning of a song. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or like trying to get some- Professor Griff. You trying to get some knowledge. Like yeah. what was the point of KRS-One? What was the point of MC Light or any of these people? And so now you listen to it and what is happening is it's reflective of the fact that our children, our youth are toxic all the way up to the brainstem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what else could come out of them? Yeah. Right? And And then it's about who is controlling it Corporately, who wants what music to go? Same thing with food. Yeah. Same, same cartel. Yeah. And I always say, you know, I make the always make this analogy. You know, when you squeeze an orange, you're never gonna get apple juice. So whatever you put in, whatever you are, that's what you are. It's simple. And it's important for us to know and understand that we have to put different things in us if we want to get a different output. Which means looking at land back to your original point looks at looking at land and property differently. Yes. I think for us as black people or as people in general right now, you know, home ownership is very um challenging and unlikely for a lot of Americans. Yeah. So for those those of us in the in the black community, it's typically our older relatives who have property. Yeah. We need to cultivate a relationship with them 
that demonstrates that we are going to value not the house, but the land that the family's house is on. 100%. Right? Yeah. And say, okay, if grandma is the one who has a house, if Uncle Earl is the one who has a house, he's too old. Let's get over there and put some fruit trees in, put a garden in, trap some rainwater. Like, think about how, because this is not for him alone, it's for the entire family. Yeah. These have, whoever has the land has to, has to now be the hub for the family. Gotcha. The safe space. Right. The protector, the key, the the gatekeeper. Yeah, because everybody else is subject to eviction. Right. And so, as I'm thinking about food again, not food products, mm. I first had a personal experience with um, food as medicine or healing myself of hypertension, sleep apnea, and obesity. And now I have this experience that I now share with other people to put them on the same roadmap. But the more and more I realize how sick our community is and how much we're at the bottom of every health metric, what I'm starting to realize we're the sickest, we died the earliest, and um, sometimes it feels hopeless. You know, um, and the reason why I say that is because sometimes I look across the socioeconomic stratus, and what I find is, and, and this isn't just how how I observe things, but even according to many statistics, it doesn't matter if black people make money or don't make money, Man, they on. still are at the bottom of the total pole when it comes to health. And so when I look at our diet, our diet itself, the African-American diet is the most poisonous, toxic diet there is in the world. So the question I have is, what role do food deserts and food inequality play and us having all these health disparities, as opposed to the percentage that is based on poor food choices. Oh, yeah. The other day, last night, as a matter of fact, I was in a in a grocery store, Sprouts. It was kind of later on in the in the evening time after doing a day of farming, and I went in, and as I'm getting up to the front area, they have the self checkout, yeah, and they have the cashiers, but there's no checkout people. There's only self-checkout. Yeah. So I go to the self-checkout. I start checking myself out. A woman walks up and she says, I guess we don't have any choice, huh? And I said, no. But if if this is the only thing open, then we ain't even talking about choice. Right. So this idea of food choices, if this is the only thing in your surrounding area, yeah. then it's not about your bad choices. Yeah. You feel what I mean? That's It's the same thing with saying, well, you know, if the education system in the inner city isn't serving the people, it's because they're sending their kids to the wrong schools. Well, damn, why'd you open up a public school with my tax dollars and put substandard teachers and substandard books in it? Right. Like, I still paid the taxes. Right. So it's all about that. It's all about not only um, food availability, it's also about marketing. Who are they marketing bad food to? Right. And how do they market the bad food to us? And why is it so prevalent? Like you, ne- you never see like back in the days, you used to have churches chickens. They're they're pretty much non-existent now. But the only place you would see them is in underserved black neighborhoods. And so and they can be open all the time. Yeah. They it's like the some somebody's bringing in a bunch of processed stuff yeah. and just making it available what i would say when we look at it is that the when the way that we're going to be able to make better choices when it comes to food is it when we reprioritize cooperation right when you asked me to when you invited me to come and have this conversation with you i was very like almost resistant to it yeah. because as you were talking about hopelessness sometimes i'm wondering like what what matters who's listening you know is it is it going to have any impact right but i salute you for doing this because this is your you're investing your own energy your own finances in making sure that people have access to information that they absolutely need right. and that people are going to be looking for increasingly as time goes on people more and more people are going to be looking for how can I feel better? Yeah. I've already gone to the doctor. I've taken all these prescriptions. I've had a couple surgeries. I've watched people in my family die. What do I need to do differently? And most of the time, it's not some big major thing. Yeah. It's like you said, watching what we put in our mouth. 
Yeah. And w- w- so how do we address some of these food injustices, food deserts? I know that, you know, you got things that you do, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are like, well, yeah, I live in this neighborhood. I can't change my zip code. Um, there's not much available, but what can I do? Man, I said, see, these questions are... Um... I want to be. I, it's my best, my highest intention to be as helpful as possible. And the first thing I would say in most major cities in the United States, you can research farmers markets. Okay. Right? You can research online farmers market in my area, and if there's a farmers market in the area, I would start there because start spending your your investing your money in your own health through a direct connection with the food. Gotcha. When you go to the farmers markets, you're spending with the with the, with the growers, you're asking for cleaner or more organic food and then you have a process of of adjusting your lifestyle to food prep. You now have to wash this food, prep it, prepare it, season it. You have to come back into that awakening of Oh, I'm responsible for this whole process. The, the full process. The full process. Yeah. Yeah. And when you get into that full process, the time that it takes, just the time that it takes, because a farmer's market ain't like Kroger. It's not going to be open all the time. Right. You're going to have to get there right. when it's open. Right. So that means a different level of personal responsibility. So at every level, you're being groomed to take food more seriously. And be more accountable. And be more accountable. And so that can prepare you to maybe decide to grow food later on or invest in a farm or any of those things. But it still has to start with, why are you changing it anyway? Because the results that you've gotten from your choices this far are not agreeable to your system. Yeah. That's not something someone did to you. Yeah. So it's time to undo it. <laughs> like we did it to ourselves. Let's undo it. Yeah. And if it's more difficult, man, I got to get there between eight and 12. Yeah. Yeah. You do. One of the people that I've like researched and I'm completely inspired by was is George Washington Carver. Mm-hmm. He was an agricultural genius, a botanist, a chemist, and an inventor of many things, including help, helping Henry Ford of Ford Cars create the assembly line. Mm-hmm. And um, many people don't know this. He's also the originator of what a lot of people refer to as regenerative farming practices mm-hmm. as well, too. Where you literally use the land to t- to to feed the land, okay, and you you find alignment with how you do things. So instead of spraying a crop, you use cover crops, mm. or maybe use nitrogen fixing crops to get rid of certain pesticides, things of that nature. And that's the way that that's one of the things I love about how you do things. You're very knowledgeable in that in that sense. And from my perspective, I've tried to emulate that in many ways on my farm as well too wonderful and stay away from pesticides because one of the things that i've learned in owning a farm and being in an area where there are many farms i've seen what it looks how farms look when they are farmed with pesticides herbicides and insecticides and how a natural farm looks and so that's one of the things where my IQ has gone up when it comes to understanding the difference between the two. Mm-hmm. But how important is it that we get food that is actually grown organic? Uh, it's it's critical because how do I say this? Um, organic is a certif in the in the United States, I should say. Okay. Organic is a certification. Yes. And as as with many certifications, a lot of it has to do with buying it. Yep. It, it's a it's a it's a cost. Yep. Pay you a thousand dollars, you get right. So, mm. if you're going to the farmers market, there is a, another certification which is certified naturally grown (CNG). Mm. Certified naturally go- grown growers are certified by other farmers. Uh, so we have this. we have a. Um, Oh man, I think we were supposed to do it today. I just remember we have a, um, a certification we're supposed to do for another farmer. Okay. I think we were supposed to do it this morning. Um, <laughs> Where we're contacted by the organization and they say there's a farmer in your area that needs to have their certification. You go check their farm. You're checking for pesticides. You're checking for all types types of different things that shouldn't be there and things that should be there, like a compost station, like diversity of flower production to bring in pollinators. Mm. So organic certification is one thing. Certified naturally grown is another thing. But what's most important is that you're getting 
food from people whom you can talk to. Gotcha. Because at Publix, it can say organic. You go to the checkout. That person at the checkout has nothing to do with anything, any product in the store. Right. They didn't produce nothing in the store. They right. come to work. And they get to the front desk. Whatever sticker on there, that's what's going <laughs> that's, in. <laughs> they can't tell you nothing about what farm it came from. Nothing. So for, my, for our farm, our farm isn't certified organic because it's not large enough. Yeah. But we are certified naturally grown and have been since 2014. Gotcha. So that means we've seen a lot of other farms. A lot of other farmers have come to our farm. Yeah. And they've said, hey. We like what you're doing here. We like what you're doing here. Gotcha. Yeah, man. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And- Tell us about Grow Where You Are in Awali mm. and how you teach others t- to grow. So Grow Where You Are is a farming business. Yeah. We are a um, ac- actually an agricultural consulting collective gotcha. because farming is a, so much bigger than just the food production. Gotcha. We focus on food production in Metro Atlanta. We go to markets. We serve um, restaurants. A lot of the restaurants that we used to serve prior to the lockdown have um, gone out of business, you know what yeah. I mean? So that was weird. But the chefs who really know that uh, good quality ingredients make their job easier, yeah. continue to shop with us. Gotcha. Um, we also do urban agricultural training, Yeah. where what we are doing is teaching young people the skills of farming on a small scale, micro farms, like a quarter of an acre, to five acres. Gotcha. And showing them how to succession plant, how to plan out your space. Where should be the the grow tunnels or the indoor farming parts? Where should be the fruit orchards? How do you cultivate um, a market for your food? What crops do you decide to grow if you only have a small amount of space? Yeah. Um, a Wally is a veganic homestead that we have in Georgia where it's primarily around plant-based living, helping people to understand how to utilize fresh ingredients that they might get from a farmer's market or from their garden yeah. and step it up and really enjoy the process of producing their, uh, preparing their food. Gotcha, gotcha. So teach you how to grow over mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. and then teach you how to make that food nutritious and delicious over here. And just live the lifestyle. Gotcha. Live a lifestyle where, again, more time outside. Yeah. More time outside, more time away from digital interference so that we can recognize what phase the moon is in, what time it is, what season it is. Yeah. So we become an earthling again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Become a human again. <laughs> and how how pivotal has it been for you to have Giovanna part of that process? And also, how do you have your kids involved in this like you were growing up? Oh, my kids are more involved than I've been. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, because they've, they've just, they're growing up with having people come to their home and them having to t- tour them around yeah. and teach them and interact with them. So I was never involved at that level. Giovanna's critical because her own um, strength is in psychology yeah. as well as uh, food and medicine prep. Yeah. So the way we partner is it's it's really it started off where I was producing the food, she was preparing the food. She has a business called Maitu, Maitu Foods, mm-hmm. and Maitu Foods is for mothers yeah. who, just after giving birth, m- meal plans could come to the house so that the the co-parent um, didn't have an issue with the food production. They knew there was going to be a breakfast, lunch, and dinner coming to the house. So a lot of it started with that, yeah. where I would produce the food, she would make these meals, get them to the mothers. And that's, then, and that's critical when you yeah. you think about today. One in 36 children are autistic today. Ooh. As compared to 1980, it was one in 10,000. That's critical when you start to think about, and they're, they're predicting it's going to be one in two very soon. And then what kind of society are we going to have? Yeah. Yeah. Who are we supposed to depend on as we mature, as Indeed. we age? Yo, yeah, that's um, those are some statistics that... because. Actually, Giovanna's mother was, um, uh, before she retired, she was a special needs um, teacher at a high school. And because many of the youth with special needs are in the public school system, they can stay in that school system until they're 22 years old. Yeah. Right? And these are some of these youth still need their diapers changed. Wow. Right. Imagine. These public school systems are going to be burdened 
with having to care for half of society. Right, who could have been dealt with properly in 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 utero as well as postpartum. Just give let the mother have some clean breast milk from clean food. Yeah. And yeah, that's um that's you kind of threw me on that with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you, and your whole family is plant based. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and have been. Um, my oldest son was. That was when we were just making our transition. So when she, when Samantha was pregnant, he she might have had some fish, but basically after that, you know, this is twenty four years ago, nothing. Inspiration. Oh man, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's just great to see them. The way that they think and the way they have so much more emotional um, self regulation. Yeah. Because they don't have these neurotoxins that are making them overreact to stimuli. And overstimulate it. And overstimulate it. Yeah. How can people learn to grow their own food? No matter where they are. I would say that most people could start by searching out a community garden. Yeah. There's oftentimes community gardens associated with churches. And more so now, people have community gardens associated with some private schools and public schools even. I would say start by going to a community garden, volunteering with somebody. Um, If you happen to have an elder in your family who you know has that knowledge, go to them, especially if they have a piece of land. And go to them humble and say, look, I'm just trying to figure this out. We can start with pots. I'm not going to try to dig up your whole yard. Start small. Yeah. We, re- we recommend that everybody start small. Start with some pots. Start with, if you're, if you're in a position where you're ready to make an investment, where you can see that it's a serious thing, maybe you have a lot of family or you're responsible for a larger community, then contact Grow Where You Are, right? Contact people who can consult and, and say, hey, you want to build a farm from scratch? This is what you need. But know that just like everything else, it requires an investment. Yep. I think people underestimate how much they spend on food, and if they protracted that out over time, like what that could that amount of money could have been used to invest on making your own food system. Right. We recently did um, Layla Ali's home garden. I guess it was about maybe this is about three years ago now. We've been helping her. Yeah, Muhammad Ali's daughter. Yes, and you know she's never lost. So she likes to remind me that she says, you know, my father lost fights. She's like, <laughs> I'm undefeated, and. She's she's undefeated. She gets things the way she wants them because she's willing to invest in them. Yeah. Because she understands how serious it is. Both her and her husband are athletes, professional yeah. athletes. So they're like, this is valuable to us. Yeah. It's worth it. Yeah. And question for you. If you ruled the world, mm. how would you heal our people? Mm. I'd put us on a social media fast okay and put us on a regimen of sleeping outside when it's most comfortable got you and eating fruits 30 days fruit sleeping outside social media fast because i i know that as as dr sabi um illustrated that when we start going through the cleansing process certainly there's going to be outbursts there's going to be outbreaks, emotional, psychological, physical. There's going to be stuff that we need to deal with. Yeah. And the further away from all the toxic stimuli we can get, the better. Gotcha. You know, so I would just pull us out, like take us camping. Yeah. I would take all black people camping <laughs> and have you and and a whole bunch of fruit people there and just serve the people fruit. Just serve them fruit. Keep music happening. You know what I mean? Keep the sunshine. And anytime anybody even tried to go for a device, be like, nah, this is for you. Yeah. This experience is just for you. Gotcha. It's not for nobody else. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Give it to yourself. <laughs> and you got you got something oh, to share here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even know, I don't even know where to start, but uh I'll start by handing that to you. Man. And then you can open that up and see what you got. There's some uh some some purple mustard greens here. Okay. Which which are super spicy, like wasabi. Oh yeah, yeah. So those are the spicy mustard. Yeah. Oh man, when yeah. you cook those, those are delicious. Man, I wouldn't even cook them. I would just cook the other greens and chop this up on top. Uh, That's that butterfly blue pea flour. Butterfly. And if you put that in a tea, tea, it'll turn everything blue. Yeah. So you squeeze we definitely... some lemon on it; it'll turn everything purple. Man, you got me has some hibiscus here. Yeah. Woo-hoo, yeah, Jamaican sorrel. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, indeed. Yeah, what man. else we got here? Some lemongrass right there. Yep. Yeah, so you can, you know, you got the people that will take care of that food, make it right. Yeah. There's a bunch of different holy basil in there, spilanthes. See, you see that little red and yellow one? Yeah. That thing there is called, it's a Amazonian herb called jambu. Okay. Or buzz buttons or Szechuan buttons. Okay. And if you nibble just a little bit of that, it, it's a vasodilant. Okay. So it just stimulates saliva. It, it is called toothache medicine. Yeah. If you take a whole one of those, it'll numb your teeth. Really? Yeah. Okay. You put me on, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, some is, Tulsi, this is holy a, basil. Yeah. This is a farmer's bouquet. Yeah. And that's all tea. That's all. Yeah. You just chop that up. And put put it in, let it steep in some boiling water for a while. Gotcha. And gotcha. I think there might be some sweet potatoes in there. Yeah, got some sweet potatoes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Got you some ready? Peppers in yeah, here. Man. Yeah, and those ain't hot. Okay, no, they're, they're not. not. No, those look okay. like they hot, but they're not okay, hot. These are sweet yeah, peppers. Yeah, man. Okay, got you. Yeah, habandas and ají dulce. Yeah, yeah, man. You, pepper. you you good? You good? You Yo good, brother? Yeah, man. You good? Giving me life. Yeah, literally. man. <laughs> Now, I want to salute you, brother. Yeah, man. I want to salute you because to be a leader in the family and the way that you're doing it, it is very difficult. But man, teach. What it you talking about? It is difficult when society is pulling you in a, in, a, in a direction constantly. Your kids want to go in another direction. Sometimes society is telling your mother what she should and shouldn't be doing. And you have to take the, bl- uh, the blows and say, no, this is where we're going. I'm setting the place. Trust me. And you know the interesting thing about that is um one of my teachers told me she when I was young and complaining about things she looked at me and she said that's the privilege and the responsibility of wearing the penis. Yep. She said you're the man. You get to come and go as you please. You get to go around the world as you please. So what comes with that is the responsibility of going out there to learn how to make the right decisions. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but what I do know is that my children have something to eat yeah. if something was to happen to me yeah. immediately, right where they live, they can go out. So that's, what, that's why the book is called Grow Where You Are. That's why the, the business is called Grow Where You Are. My original business business was called Geb Site, okay. and Geb is the spirit of the earth in comedic yep. mythology. Yep. And um, I was doing a woman's garden, and her husband is a graphic designer. Moses Mitchell. And my tagline was uh, Geb site, grow food where you are and share it with those you love. And he's like, man, grow where you are. That's all you need. (laughs) Too many words. Yeah. So I'm indebted to Moses Mitchell for that because we want to be able to tell the story and give the instruction in the brand. Yeah. So that people want to understand what we're talking about. Let's just, you can do it. Yeah. You can have all this food produced wherever you are. You can it can are. happen. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, there you have it, people. This has been an amazing episode, an amazing conversation. I hope this is has lifted your spirit. I hope that this has educated you and give you the knowledge to apply in your life so that you can start to create some food security for yourself and start to be educated on how to use food as medicine, as you can see here laid out. I want to thank you again, brother. Until the next episode, peace and blessings and Godspeed.